Hi, Hector. How are you doing? Yeah, pretty good. Thank you. Thank you for taking our time for this interview. And for those who don't know, Hector Martin will be speaking at Academy. He is our keynote speaker. And it is a great pleasure that he will be talking about his project, Asai Linux. And Hector, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself so you know our audience would know who you are? I can talk a lot about you, but it will be great <laughs> if it comes from you. Um, so I've, uh, I'm a long time Linux um, and KDE user. I've been messing around with computers since I was like seven or something like that. Um, and uh, I kind of developed a passion for um, reverse engineering and sort of weird systems. So um, I've been, you know, doing things like uh, figuring out how to run, you know, your own software on like lockdown platforms and porting Linux to things for, uh, um, you know, for quite a few years. And uh, and yeah, so when uh, when Apple released uh, the um, the M1 series of machines, I thought, hey, why not get Linux running on them? And so uh, that I started the project, and <laughs> and that's sort of uh, how I ended up here. That's amazing. So you know everybody has some story behind how they started. Like for example, you know that okay, I had interest in building stuff, and that's how I figured out that okay, this is my passion. So what was your story? <laughs> um, I don't know. I mean, I, I ever since I was really young, I liked messing around with like um, just electronics. Like even just pretend, like not knowing how it actually works. You know, just kind of pretending like I did. Um, and uh, and so I, you know when I got like my parents. Um, they're software translators, so they had computers around the house, and and so I got like you know the old computers, and uh, and so when I was like I think like seven or something like that, I started programming, and uh, and yeah, I, I got really into it, and uh, um, I like I started out with the usual you know you, you know application programming that kind of stuff, but then when I got uh, into microcontrollers. Um, that sort of got me into the, it was sort of like the Arduino before Arduino existed. <laughs> um, that sort of got me into the low level uh, side of things. And, uh, and then I discovered game consoles. And uh, it turns out it's a lot of fun to figure out how to like, make your own software for game consoles when the manufacturer doesn't want you to. <laughs> so I kind of got dragged into that world and, uh, and did a few things there. And, uh, and yeah, like, uh, that's, that's kind of how I figured out that uh, this is what I really enjoy, right? Just, uh, just sort of figuring out how to tear open black boxes and see what's inside. That's amazing. So um, I was reading your profile that you are known for hacking multiple PlayStation generations, the Wii and other devices. So would you like to discuss about that? <laughs> I mean, it was a team effort for one. It wasn't just me, but, um, but I was one of the people involved. Um, so I actually got started with the PlayStation 2 and the Game Boy Advance. The Game Boy Advance was the first game console that I owned that I like tried writing my own software for. So I didn't, I wasn't like you know the part of the team that did anything interesting on it. It was just like a user. Um, but that was kind of what got me started, right? I, I think I built like a Tetris clone for the Game Boy Advance in C. Um, and you know there was like this horrible little parallel port cable you had to use to drag download software into it. Um, and uh, and then the PlayStation Two, I, I got more into the low level and I did some reverse engineering there. So still kind of on the sidelines, right? But then that's sort of when I decided that okay, when the next game console comes, I want to be part of the team that you know that makes this happen. And so that was the Wii. And um, yeah, I actually first started out reverse engineering the Wii remote control um, because it's just Bluetooth, so you can use it from Linux if you know you know how to talk to it. And um, but then you know when uh, there was a group of people actually working on running their own software on the on the Wii, and they did a presentation. I wasn't part of the team yet, but uh, I was like, oh, okay, this is interesting. I should make friends with them. And, <laughs> and so eventually, uh, I ended up being part of the team, and um, and so I uh, I worked on releasing the um, the first exploit for the Wii that was uh, publicly released, the Twilight Hack that let you run your own software like from an SD card. And then the homebrew channel, which is the sort of most you know the most popular way of running your own software on Wii. Um, and then after that, there was more stuff um, for like uh, in taking over the bootloader and things like that, and like you know useful for recovering if you have a problem. But it, it it was a pretty long thing. Like it was several years of being uh, um, you know a big part of that community. Uh, and then you know we actually uh, looked started looking at other game consoles. And um, and so the PS3 used to be able to run Linux officially, 
And uh, then Sony apparently got scared about that and then uh, like disabled it in a firmware upgrade. And so we decided, hey, why not look into it and see if we can put it back in? Um, and we found some interesting you know, bugs and security issues. And uh, so that was another, uh, another interesting adventure. Uh, and then after that, there was also the Wii U um, and the PlayStation 4. And for the PlayStation 4, I kind of did something different because um, like, for the Wii, you could run Linux on it. Um, not very well, though, because it doesn't have a lot of RAM. For the Wii U, there was a sort of a fundamental issue with the CPU that made it uh, quite annoying to actually run a practical Linux on it. Um, it was a CPU bug that they didn't care for for software like games, but they, you know, Linux does care. Um, and but then for the PS4, it's like, well, this is kind of a PC. So instead of focusing on you know the actual running your own software part, which other people were working on, um, why don't you just focus on like seeing how well I can get Linux to run on it? And and so that that was sort of my first like semi-serious. Um, I'd done Linux ports before, but that was like the first you know sort of trying to get a lot of things working um, experience for me. And we did get it to the point where you could run like Steam games like you know full 3D and everything on the PlayStation 4 on Linux. Uh, so that was a lot of fun. So from your conversation, I just got this, that maybe, you know, uh, you had a lot of interest in games. So were you a gamer as a kid or it just <laughs> happened to be that you had an interest in on the side? I think I'm pretty average as far as playing games go. Like, you know, I, I don't think I've played more games than the average kid, but, you know, in my age. I, I mean, I still play games like, you know, Mario Kart and stuff like that. Um, I did enjoy the um, Zelda for uh, for the Switch a lot, um, but uh, but I'm not like you know a hardcore gamer or anything like that, or you know like super into any particular series. It's it's just you know kind of casual. That's interesting. So um, in your conversation, you mentioned about Sony. So on a little bit controversial topic, I heard that Sony sued you and other hackers as well. So what was the story about it? <laughs> um. So we we made it when we found those security flaws. We gave a presentation at the Chaos Communication Congress, um, just uh, you know, like yeah, from a security perspective, explaining what we found and what the problems were. We didn't release any like encryption keys because that's always controversial because um, you know they're like DMCA implications and uh, because it's used for like you know protecting games, it can be. Uh, considered to be, you know, something that enables game piracy, and then you know, there's laws, uh, you know, that get involved in that. While sort of just, you know, describing um, security flaws is a is a very different thing. Um, so we did that, and then like a week later, a different person who was not involved with us released a bunch of keys by just applying our methods, basically. Um, and then Sony sued everyone, oh. um, but. The thing is, they 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 were very confused as to what was actually happening because they they thought we were all working together with that guy, which we weren't. Um, and they also claimed we released the keys while our presentation had like SHA hashes of the keys, which is you know proof that we have the keys, but not the actual keys. You can't use it as the keys; it's not the keys. Um, so they they thought like they you know they also just said that those were the keys, which they weren't. Um, so. Yeah, the lawsuit was very confused. And I really like the last sort of um, law they claimed we break was trespass. Like, oh. I guess we were trespassing onto our own PlayStation that we bought or something. I don't know. That was that was really weird. Because, you know, they start off with, like, you know, Computer Fraud on Abuse Act, DMCA, all the usual, you know, laws that you could kind of sort of see how they're going. And then they ended with, like, trespass. What? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, yeah, thankfully, nothing much happened to me from that. Um, some of my colleagues got more of a scare um, because lawyers got involved, but we got help from the Electronic Frontier Foundation um, to, uh, you know, to sort of defend ourselves and figure out what's going on. And in the end, uh, Sony dropped the lawsuit against us and settled with uh, with the other guy. So, um, yeah, the whole thing was kind of haphazardly thrown together. I think it, it didn't make a lot of sense. But it was uh, very scary for a few months while we figured all this out. I was about to ask actually that you know if it was so scary for one moment did you think that okay I'm not going to go into this platform again I'm not hacking any more <laughs> game consoles. Um, 
it, we we did lay like lay low for a while while that was going on and we weren't sure but i mean honestly realistically the only thing sony is going to achieve by like suing you know hackers is that people are going to stop using their name when releasing this kind of stuff of right? <laughs> so like what's the point right i mean there's plenty of anonymous uh you know reverse engineers and hackers and stuff and you know we i use my name and you know because i generally don't think i'm doing anything wrong and i'm very much against game piracy and and all that but I mean, you know, it's it's not terribly difficult to be an anonymous person on the internet. So, oh. yeah. So um, coming back to the, uh, you mentioned PlayStation Four, and mm. I heard that you have demonstrated at thirty third Kiosk Communication Congress. Mm -hmm. So how was that experience? The event and whole it was people <laughs> receptive that you know it has been ported text and what was the experience? Uh, that, that I, mean, I think all of our presentations were fun. They all had their own interesting anecdotes. So that one was fun because we, we had a few moments. Um, one that a lot of people remember is that we were running PCI Express over a serial port, which is hilarious. <laughs> um, but uh, but yeah, no, that was uh, that was pretty fun, especially because I I did I did the actual entire presentation like on the PS4, like for the slides. Uh, with the PS4, like I booted it up at the beginning, right? I started it up like it's like, oh, here's the PS4 mini. Oh, oops, now it's Linux, right? Um, and here's the slides, and and then we had a demo at the end uh, with uh, where I just pulled up a game while we were doing the Q and A and just you know just played a bit. So it was fun to sort of you know getting everything together like that and showing that like okay, this actually works. Like you can you can actually just launch Linux on this and get a game running, and it's you know within the limitations of the hardware, it's it it it's something you can actually use. Um, however. Um, I will say that that work was never upstreamed because it turns out that upstreaming work is a lot less fun and a lot more, you know, sort of work than <laughs> than doing the actual port in the beginning. Yeah. Um, and then the other problem with that is that you were still relying on exploits. You're still relying on a vulnerability that, then in that case, I was, you know, I was not uh, sort of responsible for that. I was just uh, deferring to other people for it. But still, you know, it's like okay, they patch it, and then you can't use your Linux box anymore, right? So, um, so you're still kind of in this cat and mouse game, and that makes it less appealing because, like, the worst that gets, it's sort of you're doing all this work, and fewer people can use it because you know it's only people who are really invested into it who would want to, uh, like, take the downsides that come with like trying to stay on old firmware versions and that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so that makes it less. Um, you know, motivating to to actually turn it into like a polished system and upstream everything into the Linux kernel and all that because it's like, well, I'm going to do all that work, but how many people are really going to use this, right? Uh, and that's what was very different with uh, with Asahi Linux. So that's why I'm very happy about the project. Um, I also read that you were the first person to write an open source driver for Microsoft Connect. And this is something, of course, for you, um, it's now I'm talking about something. Now you're talking about open source because that's what where I come from. So mm -hmm. what was your experience? And um, how did you think about it that, OK, let's go to Microsoft Connect now? Obviously, Sony is another company. Now comes Microsoft. <laughs> it was another funny anecdote there because um, like Adafruit put out a bounty for um, the first person to like hack Connect and make a driver for it. It was like $1,000. And then Microsoft like put out an official statement saying something like, you know, we are like against people hacking our hardware, and we will, you know, I, it was something like, you know, we'll, we'll like uh, yeah. prosecute to the extent of the law or something like that. And and you know, the only thing was really funny because we're talking about writing a driver. There's no hack, like I mean, there's hacking in this sort of, you know, like tinkering sense. There's no like breaking cryptography. There's no breaking security systems. It's just a piece of hardware that plugs in via USB and you write a driver for it, right? There's not like there's, there's no law being broken there. There's nothing bad for Microsoft. It's just going to end up with people buying more connects, right? Um, doesn't make any sense. But clearly, the PR people at Microsoft who heard that didn't know what they were doing. So they put out that statement and Adafruit said, oh, uh, is that how you're doing it? Okay, $2,000. <laughs> and then they put another statement out that was kind of like, backpedaling a little bit on that, but not a lot. And then Adafruit said three thousand dollars and then they stopped putting out statements. <laughs> um but yeah no that that one was also pretty fun because um they um like the reason why the connect was interesting is because we had never had a 3D camera like that out in the market like at you know at a reasonable price. And yeah. so a lot of people mostly in like um uh doing like image recognition type stuff or like user interface like input control type stuff or even uh, accessibility um you know projects 
or robotics, like all of these people, especially in um, you know academic fields, were interested in getting at the raw data from the sensor. But Microsoft was only you know letting you use it with an Xbox, and uh, and yeah, so th there was you know a, a lot of interest from a lot of places on, around that. And the funny thing is that the Kinect actually came out later in Europe. Okay. Um, so I was in Europe at the time. And uh, so the bounty came out like when the Kinect came out in the US. And I actually had a friend um, in the US buy one. And after a while, managed to get me uh, like logs of the communications between the Kinect and the Xbox. Uh, and we had an issue with like that. We needed some hardware USB analyzer for that. And it was like taking a while to ship. And like we were kind of rushing. Um, so that part was a team effort, right? And then when I got the when I got the log from my friend, I just said, okay, I don't have the Kinect in front of me yet. I'm just going to look at the log and write a driver blind. I'm just going to write a driver and see, you know, like I, I'm I'm guessing this is how this works, and I'm just going to write the driver, and um, and so then I think the next day was the release day in Europe, and so I stayed up all night writing the driver, and then in the morning I rushed off to the to the supermarket. And managed to get my hands on one, and then I got home, and and then I just tried it, and I think it worked after like one hour of messing with it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so I just like dumped it on GitHub and said, "Have fun," and like went to sleep. <laughs> and uh, and then I woke up to like a lot of uh, you know messages and emails and things. And yeah, <laughs> that's interesting. So you just mentioned that um, you were doing all of this stuff in Europe, and right now uh, I know that you are in Japan. So traveling everywhere and is it for work or is it for your own self i'm just talking a little bit now i'm just trying to talk non-technical as well um i've ended up living in a bunch of different places um, i'm spanish I, I was born in spain but then i studied in the us for a few years then i moved back and then i was in ireland um working for a while and then i moved to japan um so I don't actually like super enjoy international travel, especially over long distances, because you know, this, like planes are a hassle and all that. Um, but uh, but it's mostly been uh, you know just uh, just living or working. Uh, so right now I'm in Japan, and uh, yeah, it's, it looks like I'm going to be staying here. That's interesting. So you like Japan for now, yes? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I enjoy it here. So coming now to, I think you are an all rounder in terms of hacking. So I've also seen that you have actually synchronized data. You have created a tool uh, which synchronizes data from iPhones to Linux computers. And oh, that was like a long time ago. Okay. <laughs> that was a long time ago. Um, that's really funny because um, so way back, what, when was it at the time? It was like before I moved to Ireland. Um, yeah, at one point I was working on the on the tooling to sync music uh, from uh, you know from music, from a Linux machine to an iPhone. My first smartphone was actually an iPhone, the original one, the iPhone 2G. Um, I guess I got it from a friend, and um, and so yeah, I needed something to work on that. There were other people working on the protocol because it was related to the stuff that uh, iPods used. Um, and so I remember when I started working on that, there was a library for like apps to use to communicate, um, but you needed a daemon that actually implemented the USB communications part. Um, so I wrote that part. They eventually merged into the same project. And um, I also think I fixed some stuff in like the Ethernet driver for tethering over USB. And there was also a cat and mouse game there because for some reason Apple didn't want like the communications is is open. There's no you know locks or anything, but this music syncing, for some reason, they put these uh, signatures on the music databases, so you can't actually sync your own music. I don't know why they did that. Um, but they kept like you know changing the algorithm to the, the this was this started with the iPhone uh, with the iPods before uh, iPhones even. But they kept changing the algorithm to like stop people from syncing music using something that's not iTunes. And I don't know why they did that. Um, but I did have some reverse engineering going on there too, just kind of figuring out the new algorithms. And there was a there was an interesting one where like they did it in a really silly way where if you already had a music database, you could just like with a very simple bit of code use the existing signature and like change it for the next you know database. So we had some tooling there. And actually, I think that was the first time that I had a package that I wrote. It was called USB Max D, the, the USB communication stuff. That was included by default in like big Linux distros. Because um, like it would get installed by default on Ubuntu as a dependency if you install the desktop. So it was like, oh, my software is now on like every Ubuntu machine. <laughs> so that was that was pretty fun. Um, 
That was an interesting experience. And now the really funny thing is that that same software stack is what you use to restore to flash uh, the new M1 Max because that you know there, there was um, there was already software to do that um, on for iPhones and Apple just reused the same thing for M1 Max. So we have open tooling for like recovering them if you if you screw up your system like the the machines are don't really have a BIOS like a PC does. So if you delete the wrong partitions, the whole thing just stops working. But you can recover it by plugging it in via USB to another machine, and then you need like special tooling for that if you don't have another Mac. So we have um, like Linux versions of that. Um, and this was uh, something that the team that I've been working on that sync stuff that I hadn't been involved with in many, many years had been working on for a while. And then you know these M1s come out. It's like, well, now I you know, need to get this working on the M1s, and especially on the newer ones that were coming out. And and so I sent in like my first patch to that project that I had started and no longer maintained in I don't know how many years it was, but it's kind of crazy. You look at the you know you filter by by my name and the Git history and it's like it was like an you know like ten year gap or something like that. <laughs> so that was uh, that was that was a blast of the blast of the past, blast of the past. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, and I need to do it again because now I have the M2 that I haven't tested and I bet it needs at least a few yeah. uh, a few patches to get it working. So I need to get around to doing that. That's interesting. So when I have noticed that you've done so many stuff, like, uh, so if I ask you, what's your favorite, like, you know, somebody would, I, you would say that, okay, I preferred working on the game consoles, or you would say that, okay, it was more interesting was iPhone or Microsoft Connect. So what you think was like the most favorite part of your whole career up till now? Uh, that's a really hard question because the, um, everything is so different, right? And and sort of it's it's not just about the actual like reverse engineering the you know the the actual you know, the work so to speak but also sort of the context right so like the Wii stuff was very uh, fun because there were so many people involved and it was such a big community of homebrew and probably the you know the, the biggest one for any game console but then again you also had to deal with like you know drama and issues in the community stuff um while like stuff like the PS4 was more like I'm just gonna sit down and like hack on this until it all works. Mm -hmm. Um, but I will say that nothing's being anywhere close to as big as Asahi and, and sort of, you know, both in scope and in how much we've accomplished and, um, and sort of, you know, the amount of people involved and all that. Um, and that, ha that I think, uh, I I'm really enjoying, you know, it, it's sort of, um, making it all work with this many people is, uh, is a really important thing. Talking about Asai, we are not going to reveal right now because that's your talk on, at Academy. But do you want to give a small teaser? What is the talk about so that you know people can attend your session? Yeah, so uh, I think a lot of people wonder, you know, like how do you do this, right? How do you take a machine that is like completely undocumented and you know it's just uh, it uh, you, you you take it out of the box and it says Mac OS on it? How do you put Linux on it? And uh, the you know the answer is uh, is complicated, but uh, there's a lot of interesting tricks that uh, that you can use, and the you know it's not as mysterious as it might sound. Um, so one thing I like to say is that like you know engineers design this thing, so if you can think like an engineer, you can figure out how it works, and uh, and so that's what we do, right? And uh, so I'm I'm going to be talking about sort of the the techniques that we use, the interesting things we found, the you know that kind of uh, you know thing because I think there's not um, a lot of uh, projects that uh, you know the reverse engineering projects of this kind of scope, and I think a lot of people are interested in in you know in sort of how do you do it. That's interesting, actually, because you know we announced it yesterday, and a lot of people have shown already interest that they are very excited to see your talk. Um, now talking about other than your technical background. So what do you do other than, you know, hacking? What's something that's really favorite? Um, so uh, my, I have a few hobbies besides, uh, you know, technology, though. They all somehow end up relating to technology in one way or another. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but mostly these days what I do is music. Um, I, yeah, I've been playing the piano for a long time just as a hobby, uh, self-taught initially, and then um, when I came to Japan, I got interested in making um, like uh, sort of cover versions, like fan covers of uh, of uh, like game music and that kind of stuff. And uh, so there's like a giant community here that does that. 
Uh, it's like there's like concerts and you know, like it's it's really serious actually. Um, so so yeah, I have my own little sort of group um, where I make uh, you know basically solo. Um, like uh, I I make the music and then have some singers sing it, and some friends help out with the lyrics in Japanese and that kind of stuff. Uh, and that's sort of that's that's sort of my personal um, hobby project. And then um, I'm also in like a couple you know like amateur bands. I mean just kind of uh, jam covers and things like that. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, I, I do enjoy music and uh, and sort of the music uh, scene in uh, in Tokyo. So this is like really interesting. Um, maybe I'm just thinking out loud, but maybe in future I'm seeing that you will be launching your own game console. You know, now you have the music, you're hacking as well. <laughs> you know, maybe down the line, maybe after ten years, five years, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't think making a game console is is, is, is quite <laughs> where I'd see myself ending up. Um, but I've actually considered um, you know, more more niche stuff, uh, things like stage technology. You know, like open stage technology, that kind of stuff. Actually, interests me for uh, and it's been on my mind for a few years. So uh, maybe something like that, because I also mess around with lasers and other you know like lighting stuff. Um, and it also kind of ties together, right? The technology and the music and all that. So yeah, I don't know if it's ever going to happen, but that that's the sort of thing that uh, that I could see myself doing uh, in a few years. That would be actually interesting to see, you know, that because it's a little different but related. Okay, if you yeah. are a technical person, but still, it will be so much interesting. And um, as I've seen, like you know, a lot of people, as you are so passionate about this, uh, do you like to you know maybe go to events or do a podcast or do you have a video mm -hmm. channel where you talk about this? so that people get inspired about it? Um, so I have a YouTube channel where I stream uh, some of my Asahi Linux work. Um, not everything, because these days there's a lot of, you know, just talking with people and, uh, and that kind of stuff. But when I sit down to, like, you know, solve a programming problem, I usually stream it. Um, so if you go to youtube.com slash markan42, that should take me to, um, to my channel. Or you can just Google it. It'll probably show up. And uh, especially at the beginning of the Asahi Linux saga, there's a lot of interesting content. I, I have um, a recap where I explain. Uh, I'll mention this in the talk, but um, if you if you want to, you know, get some teasers of what I'm talking about, there is a YouTube channel that I have. <laughs> um, there's a lot of uh, there's many hours of content there though. But um, but I talk about some of the tools that uh, that I used uh, during this project and how I developed them and that kind of stuff. Um, so. So yeah, if uh, you know if you're interested in in following uh, you know the, the sort of meat of the development, uh, I do have that. Um, I think that's pretty much it. I don't have a podcast or anything. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's interesting actually because um, my next question was actually quite related to it. So for example, a lot of people, you know, they want to pursue careers in hacking and they want to learn about game consoles, how they can actually mm. port. So for example, if a youngster would actually want to pursue this. So what would be your advice to them that, you know, this is something you should follow? Yeah, I get that question a lot. And people always expect me to like point to books and things like that. Uh, I'm sure books exist, but honestly, I just learned this like on my own, uh, you know, tinkering and, and through the internet and, you know, online documentation and that kind of thing. Um, so what I always tell people is uh, find a project that interests you, that is not like, you know, so ambitious that you can't um, like tackle it. And and like go from there, right? Like it, you know, start with something that already exists. The same way I started, you know, with like the Game Boy Advance that already had a homebrew ecosystem, and then then PlayStation Two kind of got there. Um, same thing, you know. Find if you had never done like low level engineering or programming before, then like learn some of that. Try like Arduino, but you know, don't just use the libraries. Actually, read the documentation for the chip and write your own, you know, drivers for it. Write your own uh, like low level software for it. That kind of thing. Because um, like all of that is very well documented, so you can just sit down and read the docs and figure out how it works, um, and you have the existing open source code as a reference. And, and so once you have an idea for how these things are engineered, for how the you know the kind of low level hardware works, then um, you can try a platform that maybe isn't that documented, right? And you know there's plenty of options, but there's like Android phones that you know might have interesting things that don't work maybe in like open source um, OSs for them. Or like routers, there's you know open WRT and a lot of that is also somewhat reverse engineered. So like maybe some features don't work on some model that you want to use, maybe figure out how that works. Um, that kind of stuff, right? Like where you take uh, something that like there's already an ecosystem for, but it's missing bits and pieces, and you can help out. You can help out with Asahi Linux. There's always things uh, we actually have a wiki page on like, you know, um sort of nice beginner projects um 
that uh, could use some more additions because I think all the predictors are taken right now. But uh, but yeah, there's always uh, you know little things you can help out. Like um, we have a person looking into the keyboard backlight, and I told them, okay, like you know, I know I know you you already have like this driver that works for it because it's pretty simple, but it's based on what Mac OS does, and this is like magic number here. Right? It's like you know, this magic number that we don't know what it does. Figure out what the bits do, right? And they've been coming up. And it's like, oh, this bit turns out it does this, it does that. I'm like, oh, cool. It's like, yeah, that, that's how you do it. Um, so, so yeah, that 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 sort of approach I think is um, is really is really good. Just kind of you know start um, with an existing ecosystem that is not you know too overwhelming, and then just dig at something that like nobody else has figured out before. Because there's always things that nobody else has figured out before, even in you know in well documented platforms. That's an actually very, I would say, encouraging advice. And I feel that, you know, people who are already in the field and if they encourage others, it just helps them a lot. Mm. And as you said, that they can always come and support you with your project. Uh, you have the wiki page. And um, what else do you think, uh, Hector, is something which I might have missed out and you would like to tell our audience about it and something which you feel that, you know, it's very important for this field or maybe for the developers who are actually in this field? I think the most important thing is to realize that like we're all just humans, you know, making hardware or breaking hardware. Uh, there's no, you know, there's no magic involved. It, it, it's just, in the end of the day, it's just bits and wires and transistors and zeros and ones and all that. It's, you know, you, you have a giant stack of hardware and software and things. You can always break it down into layers and look at different layers, right? Um, so you shouldn't feel overwhelmed that like th this is too complicated. I'm not going to figure it out because like we're engineers. We we abstract things. Right? We build things in layers, and the idea is that you know a single person can understand a single layer. So oh sorry. Um, so uh, you know you just uh, uh, don't don't be afraid uh, and think you know oh this is this is too much for me right. It, there's always a way of learning. There's always a way of getting into the field. There's always a, you know something you can start looking at and understand at some point in the stack. So you know don't think that like this is beyond what you can achieve. That's so true. Actually, it applies in all the fields, like whatever you're doing. That's so true. And, and especially in open source, it's really nice because like once you have open source code, you can look at all the layers, right? And it's like, how does you know KDE on Linux work well? You can read the source code all the way from like you know plasma widgets down to like assembly code and the kernel context switching. It's literally all right there, right? And I think that's really powerful. That is, that is. Thank you so much. It was really nice talking to you. And we are, including me, I'm looking forward to your talk and um, hope to see you again. And thank you once again. Um, it was really nice talking to you. Take care. Bye. Same. Thank you so much. See you.